Her name is Brooke Greenberg. She looks like a little child, but she's really 17 years old. This child doesn't grow old. She's a unique case in the world. Brooke is 76 centimeters tall, weighs seven kilograms, and her mental age is about 12 months. But for Melanie, her mother, her baby has become a teenager. I don't see her as a baby. I see Brooke as 17, she loves to be by herself. She loves to swing by herself. She loves to be in a room by herself. She lets you know when she's not happy. She lets you know when she is happy. Um, it's, they're pretty basic, but you can understand what she's trying to get across to you. A growth hormone treatment has been tried, but it didn't do anything. Unable to make a diagnostic, doctors have named Brooks' condition Syndrome X. I feel that Brooke holds some sort of secret, uh, especially in immortality. And we've teamed up with some scientists that are trying to get that secret and figure out what's going on with Brooke. Is aging a part of life, or is it a disease that we could cure one day? What is Brooke Greenberg's secret? The child who doesn't grow old. Is our lifespan directed by an invisible orchestra conductor? What are the mechanisms? Hormones, telomeres, nanorobots, are these new leads taking us to a longer, healthier life? Could science give us immortality one day? And if it is the case, is this good news? From the dawn of time, man has chased after this obsessing dream to make his life last longer. But throughout history, eternal youth seem to be associated more with magic spells. It's the ancient myth of the Fountain of Youth. Sometimes the imagination of a few has linked miracle recipes to mysterious valleys where inhabitants seem not to be touched by time. Far from legends, here is a place that is real. It's Sardinia. Centenarians live here and are certified in a population of 1,650,000 inhabitants. In the north of the island, if you search a little, you'll find this olive tree, which has a reputation of being 3,000 years old. The people who live on the island see it as the symbol of their good fortune. But what are the real causes behind the Sardinia's incredible longevity? To find out, we followed the moving laboratory of Professor Luca Dayana. This researcher from the University of Sassari has organized and supervised for years a constant medical watch on the patriarchs of the island and on those who are about to turn 100 like Antonio Manunta, 96 years old, who drove his car to come and see us. The consultation starts by a blood test and continues with a long questionnaire. But if you ask Antonio the secret behind his longevity, his answer is surprisingly simple. No vices, I don't smoke, and I don't drink. Not even a little wine? No, no, just a glass from time to time, that's all. There are a lot of reasons behind the longevity of the Sardinian centenarians. First of all, it seems that longevity is hereditary. Sardinian civilization has remained isolated for several centuries. The people have transmitted protective genes from generation to generation. This is Mariana Ferreri, 101 years old. 
proudly displayed behind her, there are photos of her parents and grandparents. All of them have reached very old ages. There is a centenarian among Mrs. Ferreri's direct ancestors. And she has a centenarian cousin living in Torino. Her husband died at 94. Her longevity, combined with her husband's, can be transmitted to their descendants, to their children, or to their nieces and nephews. Professor Diana revealed to us that by studying the blood of the Sardinian centenarians, he recently discovered proteins which have a vital role in longevity. We can't publish our discovery yet. It wouldn't be serious because the confirmation procedures are not done yet. If we did, merchants would be selling longevity proteins all over the world tomorrow. Longevity is not only inherited, lifestyle plays a very important role. A diet based on Mediterranean products explains part of the Sardinian's longevity. Magdalena Sata has just celebrated her 100th birthday. This woman, who is still strong, has had the same diet for her entire life, just like her parents and her grandparents. This red wine, Sardinian wine, every centenarian drinks one glass during a meal. This wine contains 60 to 70 percent of polyphenol, which is a substance found in plants which protects cells. I eat everything, what I make myself, and what we buy at the market. I eat all sorts of dishes, saraga, ravioli, alessandarsins, lasagna that I prepare myself, scapellita, spaghetti with mussels, spaghetti with seafood. I eat everything. We are told that Sardinians hate stress. To get rid of it, the best remedy they found is that centuries-old institution, family. When she was 100, Raimonda Corda still made beautiful embroideries. Since then, her hands have failed her, but her protective entourage has not. The family plays a vital role in the centenarian's longevity because it has a psychological effect. It provides encouragement, security, and assistance. It allows them to stay themselves as they reach the age of 100 years old. 104. <laughs> yes, yes. To reach the age of 104 years old, you're right. No. I can't walk like I used to anymore. Yes, you can't walk anymore, but you're doing very well. The role of the family is very important to help the person to become a centenarian. There is the family, of course, but there is something else. There's a psychological trait that centenarians have that has been observed closely by Dr. Christophe de Gégère, a renowned specialist on the biology of longevity. Centenarians have a characteristic that is rarely looked at, which is their psychological profile. They are far from being sweet and kind as they are often portrayed. People often say that they are wise and friendly, that they're going to take care of their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. In reality, what comes out of all the studies on centenarians is their very rigid behavior. They don't leave anything up to chance. They don't necessarily go towards others. 
They push stress away. They push it towards others, but their life is perfectly organized. They get up at 7.30 their whole lives. They eat at 7.58, always the same way. They go to pick up their mail at 9.22, not at 9.24. At 9.22, they don't have space for spontaneity in their lives, which is sometimes very difficult for the people around them. I'm going to recite the death song. The death song. Oh, death, why won't you come and take me? You see that I'm still down here, at home, on Earth. There is another aspect that has to be taken into consideration, which is death. In general, Sardinians are convinced that they're going to live for a long time, that they are never going to die. They don't think about death, and they go forward by removing the obstacles in front of them. It's perhaps by forgetting that death exists that a Sardinian olive tree managed to live 3,000 years. But longevity is not that simple. There is what we are and what we do with what we are. The genetic heritage and the lifestyle. Sardinians got lucky because they have both. Let's go back to little Brooke Greenberg. Here she is, photographed with her sisters. And this is how the years have gone by. It's very likely that the future will look like the past. I think the first five years of her life, all we did was prepare Brooke to really, to die. I mean, the doctor said she wasn't gonna make it. She went through all these procedures and everything. And every outcome was that she wasn't going to make it. In the, the last 10 years, especially the last five years, we've been told that she could live a very long time. As long as her medical condition stays the same, uh, her environment stays the same, they're saying that she could live well over 100. Until now, we thought we were going to lose her. But today, we think she's going to live a very long life. So, what happened to Brooke? What strange accident has she been the victim of? Dr. Richard Walker, the respected hormonologist, is close to the Greenbergs and has followed the little girl's case for years. Now that he's retired in St. Petersburg, Florida, he's been using his free time to gather up all his analysis into a theory about the general causes behind aging. Well, I saw Brooke on TV uh, in uh, 2005. She was on a Dateline presentation, and I was immediately taken by the fact that this child may have a condition that could bring uh, science new information about the aging process. And so I contacted the parents, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Greenberg, and after discussing uh, my interest in their daughter, and that I really wasn't going to offer any kind of cure for her condition, but that she might bring some information to science that would tell us about why we age and why we're mortal. Dr. Walker is certain that a vital mechanism has stopped or is malfunctioning in Brooke a mechanism that we will now try to shed some light on. Brooke Greenberg's condition is probably the result of a spontaneous mutation, a genetic mutation, that caused her to develop very slowly and also to be disorganized in her development. This is not unlike other genetic mutations that cause uh, changes in the rate of aging, such as progeria or Werner syndrome. In those cases, they develop faster and they undergo aging faster. In Brooke's case, the genetic effect that she has causes her to develop much slowly. Genetic malfunctions make us remember the rule. Every living species is generally programmed for a very precise lifespan. This is the case from the smallest midge to the elephant, and to human beings, of course. Let's start with ants. Depending on the species, their lifespan can go from a few weeks to a year. But some live up to 30 years. Let's continue with a little game. 
What is the maximum lifespan of a parrot? 40 years? 75 years? Or 120 years? Think about it. The answer, 120 years. Now, what about an elephant? 70 years? 90 years? Or 110 years? The answer, 70 years. Finally, what about a seagull? One year, five years, or 15 years? The answer, 15 years. Other species, such as turtles, have a biology that allows them to live longer. Let's listen to Marie-Claude Bomsel, professor at the Museum of Natural History in Paris, France. Turtles are poikilotherm, or cold-blooded, meaning that their temperature changes according to their surroundings. They use solar energy. In fact, they're solar batteries. They invented sustainable energy well before us. They have another advantage, they're herbivores, so their digestion is easy and their excretion process is slow but normal. They're big, so they have maximum energy accumulation, and the cost of their reproduction is very low because they lay their eggs and leave. This means a very long life because they have to handle their weight and therefore move and live very slowly. It's the case for them, they can live up to 150 years, which is huge. A snake lives 40 years, 50 years at most, because they eat meat, which is a lot more difficult to digest, and shortens the lifespan. Old age is a lot more prominent for mammals. These are mammals, homeothermal animals. They have to maintain a temperature at 38 degrees Celsius. To maintain a temperature at 38 degrees, you need food to keep it up. As you can see, they're quite round. Nanette is 40, Tubo is 16. As a female, Nanette has a very high cost of reproduction. She has to give birth and feed her baby, and that takes a very, very long time. So the machine gets tired a lot quicker. These animals will live up to 40, 45 years. It's not very long. It's similar to humans. Except my Tubo, in my opinion. How about it, my Tubo? We'll live an eternal love. You're going to live with me for a hundred years. Oh, what indifference. One of the most astonishing cases is the Pacific salmon, which dies after laying its eggs once. Their instinct pushes them to swim upstream to reproduce at the same spot where they were born. It's a very tiring journey that salmons do without eating anything. Once they arrived, the female lays her eggs and the male fertilizes them. From then on, they're doomed. In a few days, hormonal shocks turn them into old and fragile creatures. Life is telling them that it's time for them to disappear, which is what they do in unison, thousands of them. From their birth, their future is programmed. In two or three years, they will come to die here, in the place where they were born, right after their only reproduction. But why? Why did nature give living creatures so many different lifespans? By fantasy? On a whim? By chance? Or is there a hidden reason behind this diversity? If you look for a logic behind longevity, you won't find one. Because according to nature, you have to live, survive, and more importantly, reproduce so that the species continues. In itself, the individual doesn't matter. In other words, nature is thrifty. It gives living species only the time they need to reproduce. But man comes and changes the rules. Only man tries to escape his fate. He reproduces himself, he has children, so from then on, normally, no need to talk about retirement. He should disappear because he becomes another mouth to feed. From the point of view of the species, of course. 
But no. Man wants to stay. He wants to take advantage of it. He wants to take advantage of his earned retirement. He wants to change his fate. This is how he questions the evolution of the species completely. And we might get a few surprises because of that. Man wants to change his fate by trying to understand how this biological machine works. At first, it's marvelous. This living machine is perfectly organized and perfectly healed by an invisible but very effective maintenance service, a maintenance service as precise as the maintenance of an airplane should be. But little by little, this service relaxes and causes aging. Why does the machine malfunction after a few decades? Look at little Brooke. Is it fair to say that this child hasn't grown older? Oh, absolutely not. She's aging, uh, even though she's aging quite slowly. But if you look more importantly at the parts of her body, you'd see that she's developing at different rates. Uh, for example, if we were to look at her brain, uh, you'd see that the, you had a brain of uh, what would appear to be a child less than a year old. Uh, on the other hand, her dentition, her teeth, uh, show uh, the picture of a child about six or seven years old. Similarly, we look at her skeletal system, her, uh, uh, her bones. These are developing at the rate of a 10-year-old. And paradoxically, we look at her cells. The cells age at the same rate or beyond her chronological age. So these are 17-year-old or more. Like everyone, Brooke is growing older, but in a chaotic and disorganized way. This observation has allowed Dr. Walker to suggest a new way to understand the aging process. He suggested to compare the development of an individual to an orchestra. Well, there's really basically two parts. We have the organism, which is our bodies, and they are produced by sexual reproduction, which means that we start life as a single cell, a fertilized egg. And we have to undergo from that point a dynamic transformation or change in our bodies to become adults. And that process is not a random one. In fact, it has to be guided. And the, the way it's guided is by our genes, our regulatory genes that take us from the single cell to the full adult. He suggested to compare the development of an individual to an orchestra. First, let's see how the roles are assigned. If we were to compare the organism with the orchestra, then the body itself would be represented by the musicians. The regulatory genes would be represented by the conductor, who actually guides the musicians in their development of the theme until it reaches maturity. Progressively, under the conductor's directions, the musicians join their talents to develop the beautiful theme written in the score. This is how a human being grows and develops from infancy to sexual maturity. That perfection, that physical and, and functional per perfection is achieved when we're in our early 20s. And so this transformation is controlled by the regulatory genes uh, that direct this process up to the time that we're young adults, at which point there is no more information. Here we are at the precise moment where the conductor turns the page of his score and discovers that the next one is blank. The situation is identical for each musician. So what happened? Life in its blind logic concentrates on reproduction. Once the organism has reproduced itself, it can disappear. It's as if life forgot to write the rest of the score. That is the genetic information that would allow an organism to last beyond the reproductive age. So at this point, the conductor continues to drive the orchestra. He keeps giving instruction and, and moving his baton, yet there's no music to play. So each individual member of the orchestra starts playing by himself. As a result of that, there's a discoordination or, or a developing atonal 
uh, result and the music de deteriorates, similarly to what happens in the body. We are now getting into Dr. Walker's central hypothesis. After our sexual maturity, which is between 18 and 20, our organism, much like this orchestra gone mad, no longer has the sequence of genetic instruction, which would allow it to live without malfunctioning. There is a missing sequence. Once we reach maturity, around 18 or 20, our mechanism becomes disturbed. This score that was once perfectly written, which ended with something positive, with an adult in full possession of his senses, becomes disturbed. At that point, there is an accumulation of errors, which are globally going to be harmful and are going to create aging. And this aging will set the path for disease and will make us disappear with a period of disablement that will vary in length. And this is what most people fear. Most people aren't afraid of death. They are afraid of that period of disablement before death. From that point, we have a better understanding of what happened to Brooke. The orchestra conductor inside her was deficient from the beginning. Well, if we looked at Brooke in comparison to the orchestra, it would be as if Brooke had within her a bad conductor because if the conductor got up in front of the orchestra and started directing the musicians but not in a very good way, they wouldn't bring together a good final theme. Brooke has this type of defect in her regulatory genes so that she's not developing normally. However, the value of that in Brooke to science is that from her defect, her bad conductor, we can find ultimately the good conductor that will allow us to sustain healthy life beyond maturity. Finally, the extraordinary case of Little Brook is teaching us that if tomorrow we manage to find the right genetic sequence, which is in charge of the rest of the score, meaning our longevity, we will finally have the solution. This means that tomorrow, at 15, 20, 25 years old, we will be able to modify and to correct our various healing systems in order to allow a man to constantly restore his capacities starting at the age of 18, 20. We will fix ourselves and we're capable of doing it. At 18 years old, our system's functions are operational. It's after that they deteriorate. So if these systems remain operational, our lifespan, which we now set at a statistic of 120 maximum, could reach up to 150, 200, and much more. Of course, no one knows when biology will be able to do this. But until then, what do we do? One thing is sure, we won't just stand there. This is what people acted upon very early on here in the colorful world of Venice Beach in California. The famous anti-age movement started here in Venice in the 60s, carried out by the baby boomer generation. They saw their parents, or they see their parents, growing old and growing old badly, trying to find a retirement home, being worried by incontinence, etc. That's not what they want. They are now reaching retirement. They want to take advantage of it in good shape. This is the typical American spirit. It's not a spirit of being taken care of, but a fighting spirit. I want to be part of it, and I'll fight for it. So how are they going to do this? They are going to work on what has become unbalanced in their organism. Since we were in California, we went to Palm Springs.
Settled in the middle of the desert, 170 kilometers from Los Angeles, Palm Springs is known for its golf courses. It's also the vacation place for rich Californian retirees and a few Hollywood stars. It's here that Dr. Chain founded his institute. Criticized by some and praised by others, Dr. Chain is a pioneer in the anti-age movement. He was the first 15 years ago to suggest on a large scale a therapy based on hormonal balance. On his website, Dr. Chain reveals his formula to make us live and grow old like seagulls. The, the process of aging in humans are very different from the aging process of the seagulls. In human beings, we age because our hormones drop. And as they drop, we become ill and we die. In seagulls, their hormones are always, throughout their lifespan, very high, very optimum, and therefore they live a full lifespan without any diseases, and at the end, they drop in the ocean and die. The basis of my treatment is pretty simple, to imitate the seagulls, and that is to maintain our hormones at optimum levels throughout our lifespan. To have a better understanding of what happens at the center of the living, let's use the example of a car. Look, the dashboard shows the levels of the fluids that are necessary for the engine to work. Water, oil, gas. This is the dashboard for man, the hormonal secretions that are essential for life. For example, thyroid hormones which control the heat production in our body. Melatonin, which helps us find beauty sleep. The growth hormone, which increases the mass and the tone of our muscles. DHEA, which is secreted by our adrenal gland and has an effect on our libido, on our skin, and on our bones. Just like the fluids in a car, our hormone level drops as we get old. This is how your level of thyroid hormones decreases between 10 and 90 years old. Unfortunately, it isn't better for the DHEA. It's the same drop for melatonin. And of course, it's the same thing for the growth hormone. Hormones are actually like emails and letters. They are communications that are sent by organs to the DNA. When the hormones become less, the signal become less. And when the signals become less, the DNA gets, don't get the message. And when DNA doesn't get the message, DNA doesn't reproduce the next generation of daughters in a healthy way. The DNA produces daughters in ugly cells, uh, disease cells. For Dr. Chain, this drop in hormonal secretions explains why it becomes necessary with age to re-establish broken balances. To bring our car to the mechanic, his website is full of exemplary cases. In the before and after presentation, before they had the same age as their hormones. So they felt tired and old, very old. Before I came to Dr. Chen 11 years ago, I think I was growing old. Uh, my tennis game was not very good. My mind was not, uh, was kind of on the slow side. I was reaching a point where at times I was actually feeling a little fatigued in the middle of the day, feeling like maybe I wanted to take a nap. Then Dr. Chen steps in with a wonderful trick. Deceive our DNA thanks to the hormonal supplements in these little boxes. If I restore your hormone levels to a youthful level, 20 year old, for example, and you're 60, I restore you to a 20 year old level. What happens is your DNA is gonna get a message that, that you are now 20. So when it reproduces and then the cell, it'll be a 20 year old cell. It'll be a young cell, a youthful cell, a healthy cell, rather than reproduces another 60-year-old cell. The result is explosive. Their life seems to be transformed, as if they were 20 again. You, you feel like you did 10, 20 years ago. It's, that's what's amazing about it. You have the energy level. Uh, 
you like to get involved in sports and things like that the way, the way you did some time ago. My mental aggressiveness and my physical prowess, I believe, have both changed since I've been going to the Institute. I think right now that my mental capacity is stronger than when I was in my 30s. Of course, it's a caricature like an oversimplified commercial, yet the results are there. Millions of men and women in the world have tried this hormonal balance experiment and exclaim its benefits. But as important as they are, hormones are only one stone in a complex building. Dr. Chain is a typical example of the view that everything is about hormones. It's perfect because it answers to the demand of a lot of patients. It's a simple solution. There's a problem, there's a solution. We make an injection, it's over, everything starts again. In reality, nature and human physiology are a lot more complicated than that. This causes very few people to access this kind of longevity, medical treatment, because it implies that you have to change your lifestyle. It implies that you have to eat differently, exercise, take hormones or physiological correctors. It implies a whole set of things. Its reaction of people looking for a magical solution, just like kings or rich people used to do back in the Middle Ages or in other times in the distant past when they ate animal testicles, bull testicles, to find youth again. It's just not that simple. And I now ask you to step forward to receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. Now let's reach a new level, beyond hormones. A new lead has been followed by researchers for the past 20 years, telomeres. In 2009, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was won by these three researchers, Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Ryder, and Jack Sostak, for the discovery of how chromosomes are protected by telomeres. What is it about? The extremities of our chromosomes are like the plastic protection of a shoelace. which stops the end of the shoelace from fraying. Unfortunately, each time one of our cells splits itself, the length of our telomeres diminishes. Each split acts like a razor blade, and one day, it's over. Without its protection, our chromosome's shoelace deteriorates, and our cells become damaged at each split. This leads to old age and death. Is the story over? Well, no. The rest happens in Seattle's airport's very noisy food court. Everything is in this enzyme here, which is naturally produced by the organism. Its name, telomerase. In front of the screen, this is the biologist Michael Fossell, which we met between two planes. He's one of the researchers that works on this miracle enzyme. Telomerase is an enzyme, Gerschler protein, and in your cells what it does is it protects the telomeres and it controls the rate of cell repair and regeneration. We use it to reset aging within cells. Normally, telomerase is only active in sexual cells and cancerous cells. By protecting their telomerase, they can reproduce themselves indefinitely. Now let's imagine that a switch is installed in your body, in each cell, capable of activating or, on the contrary, inhibiting the production of telomerase. Telomerase is very important in cells. It controls both cancer and aging. So we want to be able to turn it off so we can prevent aging and we can cure aging liver diseases. We also want to be able to turn it off in cancer cells so we can stop cancer, we can cure cancer. Not enough to be able to turn it just off or just on. We want to be able to control turning it on and off so we can cure whatever we need to. Of course, the idea is great, but how can it be done? There are several leads, but today researchers are placing their hopes in this little plant. There is a plant that's been known in Chinese herbal medicine for 3,000 years 
And it turns out that one of the factors in this plant is active as a telomerase activator. So what we'd like to do is try using this clinically, try using it in patients to see if it makes an effect on aging. I think you can expect not only a longer life, but a much healthier life. And when I say longer life, could this be 10 years, 20 years? No, probably more. We're probably looking at 100 years, 200 years of healthier lifespan, not just longer lifespan. Nobody wants longer lifespan in the nursing home, in the hospital, but a healthy lifespan where you're out playing tennis, seeing your great, 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 great grandchildren, where you're healthy. The health of a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old. And again, I think we'll begin to see this in the next 10 years. Further into the future, there's another frontier. Very great longevity, several centuries of life. In Denver, Colorado, we met Dr. Terry Grossman. In his latest best-selling book, he dares to ask the question, will we live forever? His method is prevention and high technology. He's already taken precautions in case he has a heart attack tomorrow. So if tomorrow I must have a heart attack, I am very sorry to learn that. I will at least hope that I will be in a place where there are doctors that know how to use stem cells uh, available to me. Because I was fortunate enough to have saved my stem cells uh, a number of years ago, so I have some youthful stem cells available. And what the doctors are doing today in the case of a heart attack is they take stem cells usually from the patient's belly, they take the belly fat, they isolate the stem cells, and then they inject those stem cells directly into the heart of the patient, and it stops the damage from occurring. All of this is for the very near future. But what about tomorrow and after? Two revolutions await medicine. The first is nanomedicine. Nanomedicine refers to medicine done on the scale of a nanometer. Nanometer is about the size of atoms. So we will have medicine that is on the size of atoms. And the type of nanomedicine that is even available today, uh, the scientists have developed very tiny balls, and they use these balls to fill with medicine. And these can be injected into the bloodstream, and they will circulate to an area, say for instance, we want to kill a cancer cell. So over the next 10 years, this is the type of nanomedicine that will be available to us. The second and the more conclusive revolution will be nanorobots. Then great longevity will be in our sight. Nanorobots or nanobots are small devices uh, that will be made. We can't make them today because we do not have the technology to do that. But they will uh, be injected into the body and uh, circulate through the bloodstream and repair damage and fix things that we need to do. So these are little tiny submarines of the future. We anticipate they'll be available maybe around 2030, between 2030 and 2040. So we will look at life expectancies that are measured in centuries rather than decades. However, let's be careful. It won't just be a matter of medicine or technology. During the era of nanorobots, the very foundations of our society will be modified. I think that the easiest part of this problem is going to be the engineering, developing these nanobots and developing this techn technology. The hardest part is for us as human beings to adopt this technology into our lives because it's going to change virtually every aspect of life as we know it into the future. For example, in the debate about retirement in France, we're talking about a few years. But imagine that tomorrow we're going to talk about a lifespan extension of 50, 100 years. What will happen? Who will be able to benefit from it? That is also a problem. If there is 100 people, it's okay. But if there's 10,000, 100,000, what does it represent? What will it mean to people who can't benefit from it or won't benefit from it? Finally, imagine the north-south divide. It's not possible to think that we, as Westerners, can benefit of a life that extends to 150, 200 years in good health, not bedridden in an old people's home, but active, wanting to work and create, while, on the other hand, on the African continent, for example, 50% of the total population is under 15 years old in certain regions. What will happen?
Let's continue our trip around the world. We're in Varanasi in India, the holy city on the banks of the Ganges. Varanasi, the city of the dead. We're in the heart of beliefs and myths. These men and women are convinced that if they come to die in Varanasi, they will have the possibility of breaking the reincarnation cycle and reach Nirvana. When evening comes, the dead are covered in flowers and brought to the Ganges to be purified. Then they're placed on a pyre. The fire is brought from the temple of Shiva by the eldest man in the family. Nobody cries. In Varanasi, to succeed in life is to succeed in death. More importantly, you finally leave the cycle of life. When the body is coming for funeral, funeral is actually a redistribution system. Let all energies go back to its original form. Once again, it will reform a body. Soul is a smaller part of the Absolute. It can get a reunion with Absolute, but you cannot destroy it. You cannot chop it down, you cannot just reduce into ashes, it will remain. Now that we're at the border of the great longevity revolution, we need to reach a new understanding of life. If we want to live fully until 150, 200 years, and maybe much more. According to Jean-Claude Amaisen, biologist and member of the Ethics Committee, the extension of life will only be a progress when it leads us to reconsider all of our values. We've been talking a lot about sustainable development, and the question is, do we want to sustain the current tragedies for a part of humanity? Or do we want to make sure that the development is fair? that humanity lives in a situation that is fair, and then sustain it. I think it's the same thing for the growth and lifespan we're hoping for. Let's try to be as humane as possible with each person, with each child, who lives on Earth today, and if we manage to do that, then let's try to make this good life last as long as possible. Here's Brooke once again and for the last time. Will her handicap help us to lift part of the veil and to progress in understanding the most hidden secrets of life and evolution? Maybe. But how can one not be overcome with emotion in front of these large eyes, lost and staring into space? They show sadness, but also a huge hope for humanity. <laughs>